My name's David Holland QC. I'm a senior property silk in Landmark Chambers. Hi, my name's Toby Watkin. I'm a senior junior barrister at Landmark Chambers. My name's Miriam Stacey. I'm a property barrister at Landmark Chambers. Property law is essentially private law disputes uh, relating to the use and occupation of land. So it covers a broad range of topics. Um, for example, there's real property disputes like boundary disputes, trespass, rights of way, easement, rights to light, nuisance, property nuisance. And another large element of it is disputes in relation to the law of landlord and tenant. That's residential landlord and tenant, flats, or commercial landlord and tenant, such as disputes relating to offices, shops, or factories. Property law is very different to many other areas of law because of the historic way in which property law in England has developed. So unlike many areas of law where the law just changes and one day it's the law is this and the next day the law is that, it evolves in property law in a way with new areas of law being laid over the original. So you often have to think not only what is the law right now, but what was the law before? And that gives it a certain level of academic interest and uh, a certain edge to the analysis, which doesn't crop up in many areas of law. I think you have to enjoy uh, the intellectual challenge of, of trying to work out the best position for your clients in, in any particular dispute. Uh, you have to have an eye for technical detail, and you have to look at not only the big picture, but the small technical picture as well. To be a good property barrister, you certainly have to have a good attention to detail. You need to be able to meticulously go through documents uh, and analyse them. You need to have a head for logic and like clear principles. You need to have good client management skills because detailed legal principles have to be explained to them in layman's terms, which can sometimes be fairly challenging. You have to be able to multitask uh, because often you've got many balls in the air in terms of cases at different stages and um, be used to having a busy practice. Like lots of practice at the bar, I think, there are big highs and big lows. There's a lot of work involved, but there's a lot of personal commitment, a lot of personal responsibility, and there's nothing like winning a case. The highs would tend to be working out and coming up with an argument on behalf of your client and winning in front of a judge in court. That is a very intellectually stimulating process, I find. In terms of lows, it can be sometimes quite solitary um, because you are spending time in your chambers looking at paperwork. Um, I'm personally in court quite a lot, but some people have more paperwork practices and that might not suit everyone. Dealing with your tax return, VAT, um, uh, enduring the paranoia of being a self-employed person. I think my latest case involves a large hotel development in an even larger mixed-use development I I in central London. Um, my client is the leasehold owner of a large hotel which has just been built as phase one of the development. Now the landlords, the, the, the developer, doesn't want to build out phase two of the development but this has unfortunate consequences for my client because it, it means that uh, they will have to open their hotel effectively with a building site in front of uh, their, uh, their premises and that's highly undesirable for all sorts of, of reasons. So there are three interlocking agreements here which have led to this development uh, and the, the challenge was to find a, an argument, look at these three agreements and find an argument uh, to compel the landlord either to build out phase two of the development or to allow us sufficient space to be able to run our hotel profitably. To try and give you a better idea of one of the things that we do, I'll explain a case that I was in very recently. Last year, I did a case all about a pub garden. It had been used for decades by that pub and everybody thought that they had the right to do so. But my client owned the garden and my client wanted to know whether or not the pub did have the right to use the garden. The first stage, it involved a lot of legal analysis. The parties couldn't agree, so eventually it went to court and 
Rather to the surprise of the other side, the court agreed with us that the right didn't exist, even though everyone had thought it had since 1855. My latest case, in terms of the last one I did, was advising a landowner um, about a, a development that he wanted to prevent being constructed at the end of his garden. So it was a case involving the modification of a restrictive covenant that my client was opposing. He didn't want this new bungalow to be built. So that involved me well, going on a site view first and foremost to see what it would look like and then advising on the merits of the opposition then advising on the evidence and the hearings on Friday. Um, so we are then, then be involving, uh, presenting the court, cross-examining the expert, and hopefully ultimately winning the case for my client. One of the most interesting cases I've worked on is a case called Cobb and Yeoman's Row. It's a well-known case in the field of proprietary estoppel. And it involved um, a developer coming to an agreement, a handshake agreement with a landowner. Um, about a property in Chelsea and he was going to do some work to get planning permission and he incurred a lot of time and money on that on the back of an expectation that he would get a cut of the profits but the day after planning permission was obtained she pulled the rug from under him and said that he had no right um, so that led to him bringing a claim against her in equity it was extremely interesting to see it play out in the High Court where he won and then at Court of Appeal and ultimately it ended up in the House of Lords uh, where he was unsuccessful. Um, but in terms of the wider ramifications for the law of proprietary estoppel it was fascinating um, and it involved an interesting human element which had wider ramifications. One of the great things about property law and the law in general I think is that cases are very interesting not just because they're interesting legally but because the situation that you get to deal with is something outside your normal experience. So in the last year, I've been dealing with geotechnical evidence, looking underground, deep underground at how soil moves. But equally, the last case I did before Christmas involved Chelsea Football Club and people climbing on the roof. And so I had the great experience of having a tour of Stamford Bridge Stadium. The great thing about our job is that it's never the same two days in a row. It's always interesting and the problems are always complicated, so it selects itself as an interesting thing to do. There are a number of steps I think you can take. Um, first of all, get as good a degree as you can from whatever institution you're at. A first uh, from any institution it stands you in very good stead, um, certainly in our chambers. Secondly, if you want to do property law, we have a particular property pupillage and you will need to demonstrate to us some sort of tangible interest in property law. Now that can be from taking various property options during your degree, it can be from doing pro bono units and property cases, it can be working for a property company, it can be doing a thesis on property law, some sort, uh, sort of demonstration that you actually want to do property law or have an interest in it. And thirdly, we'd be looking to see doing mini pupillages the best thing you can do if you want to understand whether or not property law is for you is to see it in action. So that can be several different things. You can come and see us by taking a mini pupillage here or it's just as easy to go and see a specialist property court of which there are lots around the country. You can read all the books about property law you like and even if you study property law as I did at university, it's very different when it's in actual practice. Students can prepare for a career in property law at Landmark Chambers by doing mini pupillages uh, by doing the property law moot which Landmark Chambers has up and running which is um, beneficial by reading um, and specifically I'd say reading with Gary and Wade and perhaps by doing as much advocacy as possible and taking property modules beyond the obvious ones.